The idea of a console war or computer war is almost quaint now. These days it's something almost entirely based on aesthetics. Which do you prefer, the big rectangular edgy black box with an X on the front of it, or the also big and rectangular black box with a few little squiggles on it? Either way they'll do most of the things you want it to do straight away. Watch Twitch, lollygag on YouTube, catch the latest sports event, oh and they'll play some games too. That wasn't always the case, of course. In the days when machines were actually different, this sort of war, and yeah I know war, used to mean something, dude. Because, you know, there were actual differences, big ones. With the Mega Drive or SNES, you weren't just sticking your colours to a mask. You were going to get a pretty different experience depending on what console you chose, and there'd be a lot of games on one machine that you wouldn't be able to play on the other, as well as games on yours that you could happily wave in your rival's face. That was the war of my childhood anyway. But to examine a particular console or computer war, I want to go back further, to something where the differences were even more pronounced. The Great British Playground Computer War of the 1980s, the Commodore 64 vs the ZX Spectrum. You kind of have to look at this with two hats, and they're both quite different. There's the considered critical one where you have to be fair to both systems, talk about one's strengths and the other's weaknesses and so forth, and there's the one you had in the playground that unquestioningly supports the other system regardless of anything. It's kind of a mishmash. In some people's eyes this war just defied all logic, mostly the people who were with the C64, but there was something in that spectrum that drew people towards it for a long time. The best thing to do I suppose is to just look at the timelines, the culture and the people. Technical information and the like was never really my bag anyway. It all began in 1982. After two previous attempts at making an affordable home computer, both more successful than the last, the ZX80 and the ZX81, Sinclair Research struck gold with the release of the Spectrum 48K. In pictures it looks staggeringly beautiful, black as night, the rainbow line across it, it's a beauty. In the flesh, well you've got that membrane keyboard to contend with, described in many circles as feeling like you were pressing against the cheekbones of a recently dredged up corpse. Or is that just me? The Spectrum was billed as a computer for the people, the machine that would take computing to the masses. A relatively low price point of £175 helped, an incredibly low price for 48k of memory len, and the result was pretty successful right from the off. A few months later the C64 launched in the UK, having already prospered in its home country of America. The C64's pitch was simple. It was by far the best computer out there, with every other computer frankly being chicken scratch compared to it, especially at the price it cost. Who cares if it's an ugly beast that yellows up the second you look at it funny? It doesn't need to look good, it's the best. This machine would also try to take compute into the masses, but if it could then it would do it by force. The C64 launched for £399, over twice the cost of a Spectrum, because it was the premium product. You don't want this second rate monochrome cack, you want to save up for the best you can get. There is perhaps no difference between the two computers more marked than the difference between the two computers figureheads. The Spectrum was invented and pushed by Clive Sinclair, and he's a rather affable, unassuming man. He looks like a science teacher, somewhat owl-esque, peering down from behind big glasses, a man who could well be described as quintessentially British. The quaint well-spoken demeanour does well to hide a steely determination, he was by no means a pushover, but Clive had the people in his heart. Even if he didn't necessarily know how he could best sell things to them, he wanted to bring the Spectrum to the masses because he thought that it was in the best interest of the people, that a knowledge of computers, even of coding itself, was important and would become even more important in the years to come. And undoubtedly he was right. It's for this reason that not long after the launch of the Spectrum, he would arise as Sir Clive. Whenever you see him to this day, that enthusiasm and passion still pours out of him, that what he is making is the best thing for the people, not necessarily the best thing for his wallet. This sense of self would serve him well with the Spectrum, even if it did not necessarily serve him well with all of his projects. And who was the C64's figurehead? Jack Trammell, an iron-nosed Polish-American Holocaust survivor who brought his company up from nothing, a taxi cab, a moment of inspiration, and an idea. He didn't invent anything, but he recruited people who he knew could. He listened to them when it came to the question of calculators versus microcomputers, and from the first Commodore computer onwards, the PET, he set out his stall to sell these products to oblivion and on towards domination. 
When you talk about computer wars or whatever, the term does not seem all that much of an exaggeration when you look at Jack Trammell. His competitors were unquestionably the enemy, and his sole purpose was to crush them and build Commodore off their broken backs. He would bully wholesalers, providers and manufacturers into backing Commodore, openly tear down the competition, and would engage in long and bitter price wars with rivals like Texas Instruments. The term playing hardball was coined purely for people like Trammell. People certainly respected him as a master businessman, but a lot of people frankly despised him and Commodore for the way they went about their business. He is undoubtedly one of the truly important figures, one of the legends of the American computer business, but no one gets to such heights through being all sweetness and light. Frankly, you could not find two people more different than Clive and Jack, and it absolutely shows in their two products. This particular war, of course, was not a global event. The C64 was largely dominant in the Western world. America? <laughs> Sinclair did try and market his computers to the US following a partnership with Timex, but the resulting products, the ZX81-based TS1000 and 1500, and the Spectrum-based 2048 and 2068, were all failures. Mocked in comparison to the C64 and other superior competitors, barely a blip on Trammell's radar, a fly to be squashed at will, and so they were. Even the majority of Europe and other PAL countries were flying the C64 flag. Australia was all about the C64, as was West Germany, the Netherlands, Italy. The only major holdouts from the C64 were Spain, who backed the Spectrum, and France, who backed the Amstrad CPC, because they're just different. No, this battle was almost totally localised to the United Kingdom alone, because we're kind of different too. I don't think it's particularly unreasonable to say that a fair bit of this had to do with class as well as national pride. As it always is in a conservative government and in hell just Britain in general, class was a big issue, particularly in the early 80s. It's not necessarily just about the price alone, it's worth examining why people would get behind the spectrum compared to other British computers like the Amstrad CPC, the Acorn Electron, or even the all-powerful BBC Micro which was usually the machine of choice for schools across the country. And again, it perhaps has a lot to do with the way that the Spectrum was pushed at first, as the computer for the people. Many a person could say such a thing, but only someone like Sir Clive, in his earnest way, could have you believe it. He said that there would soon be a computer in every home in the country, and a few people really took the piss out of him for it. But he was kind of totally right. Sir Clive did not build the Spectrum so that he would have you in his grasp forever, endlessly buying new models that were wholly incompatible with what came before. This, by the way, was a staple of Commodore's business practice. The Spectrum was almost like a gateway drug, an induction into the world of computing, and many people took it. Indeed, the Spectrum's manual comes with hundreds of pages explaining basic code and how it works, culminating in giving you the code to create your own, fully functioning program from scratch, almost as if you'd signed up to a coding course when you bought the machine. In a time when the working classes were largely expected to offer their backs for the richer part of the country to build upon, the opportunities provided by something like the Spectrum were more than welcome. You can learn from this, and you can be a part of this too. Even people who know nothing else about coding know how to make a crude sentence loop on the spectrum forevermore, or at least until it runs out of memory. On the matter of national pride, the spectrum was a symbol of British invention and British success, at a time when almost everything else was rotting. The early 80s were a dark time, the mines were being closed down, the British motor car industry was dying, public services were under constant threat of privatisation, Imports, trade agreements and the idea of the entrepreneur were the order of the day, such as Thatcherism. But here at least was one shining light, a machine that was fighting the good fight and enticing the people towards it, a machine that was absolutely 100% British and British made. And a natural underdog too, particularly when compared to these Americans with their hulking great system that was, well, a bit more frivolous. The C64 was not designed to get people into coding on the ground floor, it was virtually inaccessible in that regard, and there was a definite sense that you were not supposed to mess with it beyond any of the pokes for games that you found in the pages of Zap. It was designed for the purposes of entertainment, which it did a ban up job of, but the hefty price meant that it was more at all for the middle classes. Something to play with, not something that you could play with, but also, theoretically, learn something from too. 
Now I go into all of these angles naturally with a fairly biased point of view, as an opening salvo to shy away from what is probably the biggest issue for most people watching this, that of the games. The area where, by all whites, the C64 should smash the spectrum into oblivion. The C64 virtually from the off was marketed as having the best games around. It could recreate arcade experiences as well as produce state of the art experiences that only it could do. Plus you could theoretically do your word processing on it as well. The Spectrum on the other hand? Well the 48k didn't even have a joystick port, you needed an adapter for it. Sir Clive was never remotely interested in the Spectrum as a games machine. He saw it principally as a means to learn coding, and as a machine that could be used by businesses. It did the coding part very well, which naturally led to plenty of games because, well it turns out that's what people like to create. But in this regard Sir Clive was like a beleaguered headmaster confronted with the youth of today. He was happy to let it go on, but he couldn't ever understand it. On the technical side there's a lot of game based stuff that the C64 finds so much easier to do, right off the bat. It is relatively easy to make a typical, side scrolling arcade action game. You'll notice that you rarely see such games on the spectrum, they're often flip screen for example, or just extremely limited and slow. This is because making such a game on the system is incredibly hard to do. Something like, for example, the late Joffa Smith's Cobra is a much greater technical achievement than it might first appear. The amount of coding know-how required to get scrolling even this smooth on the spectrum is phenomenal. This speaks well of the ingenuity of specky programmers. They knew the system inside out and could produce endless workarounds for it, resulting in much more variation in the games on offer, arguably. But still, when it comes to the more traditional showcases, the C64 has it. The Spectrum simply couldn't possibly fully produce a game like Euridium, or Encounter, or Ball Blazer. There's only so much it could do. Mind you, the C64 couldn't possibly fully produce a game like Darkstar. In some areas, such as speed and processor power, the Spectrum actually beats the C64. But the way it uses such fins aren't exactly optimised for gaming. Still, there are other questions here beyond pure power and how close a game can get to the arcades. Again, there's a question of aesthetics. In terms of looks, what do you prefer? There is definitely both a generic C64 game and a generic Spectrum game. A generic C64 game is a lot chunkier than the specy equivalent, and there'll be considerably more colour. The scrolling will take more advantage of the system hardware and will be a lot smoother, without all the colours bleeding and clashing everywhere. And of course there's the music. The C64 had the much celebrated SID chip, a multi-channel behemoth that was, in the hands of brilliant musicians like Ben Daglish and Wob Hubbard, capable of producing a symphony. The Spectrum 48K had a single channel beeper, you could set its pitch, frequency and what have you, and you could turn it on and off. And that was about it for most games, unless for some reason you had Tim Fallin just lurking around there. The later 128K systems had an AY chip that made for better sound, but it still wasn't a patch on the SID. On the graphics front, the specy was, well, usually quite monochrome. Too much colour would result in tons of unsightly clash. The sprites and the like were usually simple, hand-drawn, and provided on graph paper with a black border around them, or a white one, to try and prevent the bleed. Most games were not smooth, certainly not when compared to the C64. It's limited in a lot more ways. But limitation can breed creativity, and the Spectrum was able to create a style all of its own. There's a quirkiness about the Spectrum style, something about it that looks homemade. It may not be technically dazzling, but it has quite a lot of personality. Being as close to the arcade as you possibly can be is not necessarily the best way to go. There's a lot of more one of the mill C64 games out there that may look okay for the time, but they're deathly boring. Whereas often, even in the more mundane specy games, I can find something about the graphics that amuses me, allows more suspension of disbelief. It's easier to love. Of course this can go out the window when you throw in one of the best C64 games, something like a Monty on the One or a Last Ninja 2 or Micropro Soccer. They're just amazing in every regard and filled with personality. But there are places where the spectrum can definitely hold its own. I mean Rainbow Islands is one of the best games on either system and both of the arcade ports for it do a fine job of emulating the arcade in their own way. It kinda comes down to what you prefer. It's kind of difficult to keep going with this angle to be honest. We could go through port after port, doing a big face off for each one, 
but it's all a bit meaningless at the end of the day, as they often tend to play the same. You've got a keyboard or a joystick, pick one, and the look tends to be based on what you prefer. But that's one of the whole joys of a computer war, isn't it? It's almost like a game of top trumps. We've got this game, look at the graphics on that. Oh yeah, well we've got this game, listen to how it sounds. And so on and so on. It's one of the best things about the playgrounds of old, how passionate people would get, an endless parade of point scoring. Yeah, some people may actually take it too seriously, and some even continue on with it well into their adult lives, past the point where anyone should truly care about it. But still, arguing about old machines is pretty nostalgic. I've even done a bit of it myself in videos, what with the ongoing Ness and Master System rivalry I've got. And it's not really because old rivalries never die, it's because old rivalries were just fun. And the comments are usually fun too, not just seeing people talk about the houses they used to represent, but to see those who never actually stopped fighting. Less. In 2015, the Spectrum and the C64 are both long dead. So there's one really important question that needs to be answered, somewhat, before this video can end. Who won? We all want to know that, don't we? And what was the aftermath? Well, as far as total numbers go, the ZX Spectrum sold roughly 5 million units worldwide across all of its models, pretty much all of which were in the UK. Across its lifetime, the C64 sold as many as 17 million units worldwide, maybe more, making it the highest selling single computer model of all time. However, it's unclear just how many of those were sold in the UK. By all accounts, both systems are pretty damn close to each other over here, so we'll try and piece it together as best as we can. The Spectrum and C64 battle was end to end throughout the 80s. In the early part of the decade, thanks to the low price, the head start and the British pride, the Spectrum lauded it over everyone, including the C64. The video game crash of 1983 did not exactly help Commodore, especially considering that they were one of the main companies who'd helped to trigger it. There was lots of trouble back home, a lot of inner turmoil, and in early 1984 the upshot of it all was that Jack Trammell left Commodore following a power struggle with Commodore's chairman, Irving Gould. The intimidation game that Commodore had played was now suddenly biting them in the arse as providers refused to work with them, and there was a thought that Commodore itself might be a casualty of the crash. On top of that, it wasn't too long before Trammell resurfaced as the head of Atari Corp, set to crush all opposition with the next generation of computers in the shape of the Atari ST. The company that he had founded was now his mortal enemy. Tough times for Commodore, and international operations suffered a bit. Of course, the video game crash of 1983 was almost totally localised in North America, so it had no effect on the ZX Spectrum at all, short of completely killing any hope of expanding into the US with Timex, and that was already dead. And thus, the Spectrum's lead over Commodore increased. However, Sir Clive's passion for invention and desire to create something that the people wanted, that he truly wanted to create, if that makes sense, drew him into missteps that we've previously spoken about. Just remember, Sir Clive never wanted to make a games machine. The Sinclair QL, essentially Sir Clive's clarification of what he'd hoped the Spectrum would have been, the TV-80, the C5, the initial Spectrum 128K launch, they all had their positives, but they were all failures, all costing tons of money, and Sinclair were only successful in the UK alone, so it's not like they had tons of it to spare. Alas, it was too much loss for Sinclair to continue marketing and selling the Spectrum, and in 1986 they sold the computer and the Sinclair research brand name to Amstrad. Exit charming and affable Sir Clive, enter entrepreneurial shouty cockney twats to mind Lord Sir Alan Sugar. On the other side, Commodore held onto the C64. Their attempt at an upgrade of it, the Commodore 128, hadn't wholly come off, and so it stayed on as their budget computer while the main focus was on fighting an increasingly bitter war with Trammell's Atari through their newly acquired next generation computer, the Amiga, which they saved from a typically fair Trammell deal which basically went, pay back this loan to save the company within a month or I will own everything that you have. It was this move into the budget market, along with the Speccy's instability, that allowed the C64 to fight back against the Speccy in the UK through the second half of the 80s. It was the more impressive system in various ways, and it ended up being what quite a lot of the people wanted. There's not a massive amount to say beyond that. The main thing about both the Speccy and C64 in the latter part of the decade was that they both absolutely refused to die out. 
The Spectrum, now finally advertised as a games machine first and foremost, although still with all the same coding stuff as before, hung on like grim death until around about 1992. The Commodore lasted even longer. It was sold in some stores right up until 1994, even outlasting the system that was made to replace it, and finally dying along with Commodore itself. Ever since the crash, the company had pretty much always been in turmoil, constantly mismanaging their product lines, creating products that were almost totally irrelevant before they were even released, pissing off just about everyone they worked with, and still the C64 clung on despite everything, although it should have probably been dropped a good couple of years before it actually was. Either way, they both did well to last through the Master System and the NES, not to mention the introduction of much higher end computers. It's important to note that here in the UK, we never had that period where a microcomputer was virtually a dirty word that the Americans had after the crash, a time when games were scorned upon, computers were either a total luxury or for business only, and the NES basically snuck in to dominate the American market through hiding the true purpose of the machine with entertainment systems, game packs, and a cute little robot. The advent of Nintendo killed the affordable microcomputer market in North America, leaving Amigas, Atari STs, and the even more high-end Macintosh and IBM PC systems to the wealthy. Here in the UK, there was always a market for the affordable computer, especially for the kid who could happily convince their parents that, hey, I can do my sums on this too, while they went ahead and spent hours playing Jet Set Willy, and the more affordable they were, the more appealing they were to said parents. And so they hung on, squeezed, reduced in price over and over until finally there was simply nothing left. The long life of the C64, and particularly the Spectrum, is mostly to do with winning out of flannel over and over again until you're absolutely positive there's no moisture left in it, although it is still an impressive feat. And without it, my parents wouldn't have bought me a Specky in 1989, allowing me to stick my own colours to a mast. Of course, no one really cared by that point anyway. I suppose it's obvious who I would say won the war, but then you could ask someone else and get an opinion that suits you. For now though, it's time to end this look back at the war to end all wars, the battle of one box of boards and wires against another that defined a whole period of our glorious nation. Or something. Bye for now!